Evening all and uh, welcome back to the WTF and tonight we've got another uh, bizarre and interesting video for you. Uh, this uh, thing here which uh, is not actually quite what it seems. Uh, so this piece of equipment here is the latest project and it uh, started life as a piece of World War II navigation I wouldn't say radar but navigation equipment and we managed to turn it into something a bit more useful namely a oscilloscope. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a little bit about this and how I've managed to do this and uh, yeah some interesting tips if you want to build a homebrew valve oscilloscope which is what this is. Anyway let's just uh, take a quick closer look and we'll open it up and have a look inside. So what we have in front of us is actually uh, a piece of World War II aircraft gear and it is an indicator unit, an AN4 indicator unit which was part of the LORAN system of navigation which is a very early form of navigation which did actually persist or um, I think it was developed around about the 1940s but it wasn't actually used at least until the uh, sort of mid 70s when it was replaced by Decker uh, from what I understand. Now I'm not going to get into the specifics of how the LORAN system worked but this was essentially the indicator unit uh, from an old LORAN system which as I mentioned is from World War II and this unit would have come with a transmitter receiver unit sort of like a black box and was would have been in an aircraft and uh, there would have been a couple of air antennas aerials antennas on the aircraft and this unit would have displayed the information now I got this black box with this cathode ray tube and I thought to myself well what are we going to do with it? Because there's no way I'm going to be able to set up, the, you know, the, the original system. I haven't got all the black boxes, and I we don't really have a Dakota or a uh, B-17 or something like that uh, to demonstrate it. Um, so it's either going to end up on a shelf for the rest of its life, or we can repurpose it and use it for something else. So hence the reason why it is now an oscilloscope. And what I've tried to do here is keep the original box and the original front panel without sort of altering too much. I did have to alter obviously a lot of the electronics inside and I've tried to convert it into an oscilloscope which <laughs> um, it's a very basic oscilloscope and we'll go through you know how I've done this uh, in a minute and you know it's not um, it's certainly not a Tektronics, uh, but it does actually uh, display waveforms. It's not really going to be good for <coughs> um, demonstrating, you know, measure well, taking measurements and things like that. Uh, but if you want to see, you know, a visual image of what you're actually receiving, you know, it's quite good for that. Which is basically the same as all valve, old valve oscilloscopes. You know, they just simply don't have the band, the bandwidth. Um, they're not really sensitive enough you know, for, for for the per you know when you compare them to to modern oscilloscopes. But but it is quite nice. You know it looks nice. It's got a big cathode ray tube, and I thought well we've got to do something with it. So let's let's at least convert it into something into something that we can actually use rather than you know sticking it on a shelf never to be used again. So what are we going to do? Is we're going to have a look inside, and we'll also show you the circuit diagram that I've used. To, to create this thing, um, some of the problems I've had with it. Uh, so, if you're contemplating building a valve oscilloscope, you know perhaps uh, there's some lessons to be learnt, which I've certainly discovered while I've while I've uh, been building this. So, let's have a quick uh, closer look at it. So, just looking at the front panel, we'll see if we can uh, zoom in a little bit. Just uh, adjust the camera slightly. 
So at the moment I've got this rigged up to a signal generator and it's, and it's running at about uh, 1500 hertz. And the, uh, the front panel and everything is, uh, is quite similar to what you find on a normal oscilloscope. So we've got sort of X shift, uh, Y shift, uh, horizontal gain, vertical gain. Um, one of the things I have noticed with this with this scope is that the synchronization and the sort of time based locking is has been a little bit tricky to get right and uh there's a number of reasons for that um but it's it's for what it is is I'm reasonably happy with it you know it's a it's a basic oscilloscope it's not going to set the world on fire by any means. Uh, but it, it will display a waveform, which I guess is probably what you want. Um, it's, I've tried to incorporate uh, some vertical gain uh, selectivity on it, so you can adjust the sort of input, the height, the input again. It's uh, the synchronization and the flyback. There is some fly, some, some retracing there, which. Uh, Despite my best efforts, efforts I haven't been able to solve. So you've got that, and then we can just adjust the uh, fine time-based adjustment there, so it more or less uh, can get a single trace. And you've got different uh, time-based settings there with this switch here. And again, the faster it is, the more difficult it. Well, well certainly I've found the more the faster it gets, the more difficult it is to get a uh, time base to lock so if anybody's got any suggestions about that I'd be interested to hear you can put, leave a comment uh, let's just put it back to what it was that's usually the best thing there there we go anyhow um, so that's the front panel and as I said I've tried to keep the original most of the original knobs and dials that were there on this unit on the AN4 display unit I've tried to keep. I haven't. I've drilled. I've had to maybe drill out one or two holes for um, a couple of switches and knobs there. What you will notice is that if I can just turn over there, it's got a separate power supply, and I uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Actually, the um, original plan with this oscilloscope was to try and build everything in one box, but. Uh, I had a few issues with that, so hence uh, I've got a separate power supply. That uh, power supply over there, which I sh just showed you, is actually my sort of universal uh, CRT power supply, which I've used for a couple of homebrew CRT projects, which supplies um, all the high voltages and everything. Anyhow, so uh, let's take a look inside, and I'll also show you the circuit diagram, so you know how I've used different... Uh, circuits to build this because it's sort of like a hybrid of sort of various uh, oscilloscope uh, models um, to try and uh, get this thing to work so uh, let's have a look inside so before we have a look inside the oscilloscope I'm, I'm just going to show you the uh, circuit diagram or circuit diagrams as I should say because uh, this scope was based on uh, several uh, models I, uh, that um, have been made in the past. Anyhow, this is the ICO 430 oscilloscope circuit diagram, and I have used this. I have used this circuit diagram for the time base and the horizontal amplifier. And the reason why I've used this is essentially because this uh, circuit, um, especially the time-based uh, capacitor selector, was the most easiest that I could adapt to the multi-switch or multi-position wafer switches that I had available. One of the problems with oscilloscopes is that the time-based switching uh, can be quite complicated. Now, usually the, um, the oscilloscope um, time base is based on like a double triode, like a multi-vibrator type arrangement, which is quite common. Um, but this one uh, has only, you only need to switch into uh, 
one one set of capacitors. Okay, now a lot of other time-based circuits that I looked at, you, you had to, um, uh, two. You had to switch in not only a capacitor which would select the frequency of oscillation for the time-based circuit, but also a coupling capacitor as well, an appropriate coupling capacitor, and that just made things a little bit more complicated. And this was really the most simplest uh, time-based circuit that I could find. Uh, so this is what I used, and um, it's. It, it, I mean, it works, but I I just wonder just how good it really is. I mean, one of the things with simplicity is that you may compromise on sort of performance, and I think I've probably uh, you know had to bite the bullet with that. Anyhow, it does it does work, um, but it's not particularly good on higher frequencies. That's certainly what I found on with this oscilloscope, and the other thing is the synchronization is. I think is also a little bit of an issue um, having built up this and also got it to work on the scope. So let's uh, take a look at the circuit diagram that I use for the vertical amplifier uh, and then uh, we we'll sort of join them all up together and then we've actually more or less got the circuit diagram of the actual scope. So this circuit diagram here is from a Heathkit 08 oscilloscope and Heathkit as I'm sure most people will remember uh, produced a lot of uh, interesting uh, kits for radio amateurs and for electronics enthusiasts including their O series of oscilloscopes I think they started off at an O1 and then went through to O8, OI18 or something and then they they originally started off as valve oscilloscopes and then slowly progressed to more complicated solid state ones. In fact, some of these Heathkit scopes were actually, you know, pretty good in their performance, you know, considering that a lot of them were valve oscilloscopes. The uh, the Heathkit 08, uh, w which is the one that I chose uh, for the vertical amplifier, uh, was, um, yeah, just because it's, I had problems initially with the ICO design I thought there was some stability issues and so I decided to change this. The um, challenge that I had with with my scope was that I wanted to, well the original uh, scope as we'll see in a minute, uh, most of the sockets were all octal so I wanted to keep, I wanted to have to keep those and use octal valves but most of the schematics that I looked at actually use these miniature valves so this 1287 etc. Uh, so what I've tried to do is substitute the original 6SN7s which the, the scope or the original AN4 indicator unit was full of and try and use those in, in substitution for the 1287s. Uh, you also see that it's got 6J5 which is an octal valve, 6C4 which is a miniature valve so we, I managed to sort of get this to work with you know, using octal valves um, <clears throat> uh, alone. Uh, so the question you might ask yourself was, why didn't I build the whole thing up based on the Heathkit 08? Well, again, it came down to the problem with these wafer switches. Um, <clears throat> you know, trying to find or trying to sort out a wafer switch. Uh, you know, a multi, um, you know, which is uh, multi, a multiple rotary switch, multi rotary wafer switch, call it what you like, uh, which was you know, resemble this, uh, I mean, you can, you know, sometimes broggle them or, or you know, use a, a switch and try and get to the best combination, but the ones, the switches that I had, you know, I really battled to try and um, copy this diagram, so in the end I went for the sort of simpler ICO time base and horizontal amplifier, which is actually, to be honest with you, is not much different from this, it's just this time base is slightly different. So that's the reason why I didn't sort of just copy the the 08, you know, uh, completely. The uh, voltages for the scope, uh, which again we'll have a look at. So my tube uh, that we've got here is a 5CP1, uh, which is similar to what they've got here. And uh, they use um, a bleeding chain, which uh, I've slightly modified uh to, to my own purposes, uh, which does seem to work. In fact, the 
the bleeder chain that I've used here, uh, although it's similar, is actually more based on the original circuit diagram of the AN4, uh, which I managed to dig out by scouring the internet. And I've used that. They've got a couple of modifications here. Um, you know, some of the values of these pots are slightly different. Uh, but um, we'll have a look at that in a minute when we have a look inside. So I've taken the cover off and obviously the first thing that you notice is the CRT tube. And as I mentioned in the uh, little snippet with the circuit diagrams, it is a 5CP1. Now the 5CP1 is quite a nice tube. You know, it's a lovely big uh, five inch uh, diameter tube. And this one is quite nice because it comes with the original uh, mu metal screen which is always quite helpful and as you can see on the original chassis uh, it sits quite nicely uh, every, a lot of the uh, metal work and metal bashing is already done and what you will notice on the original uh, chassis is there are a lot of valve holes for valve holders and this a unit originally had something like 20 valves and most of them, the majority of them were 6SN7s and when I opened this up I thought if I was an audiophile uh, this I would be in audiophile heaven with a number of 6SN7s this thing had inside it. So one of the problems with this 5CP1, well I wouldn't well, that's sort of a problem but it is not insurmountable, is that it has um, quite high voltage requirement so in order for the bleeder chain you need something like minus 1200 volts and the other thing as well with the 5 CP1 it's got a accelerating anode which needs about 1500 volts positive and when I constructed this originally I actually wanted it to be I wanted the power supply all to be in one unit and I was thinking of using the uh, old Chinese inverters which uh, did work in terms of getting the voltages using various I think I used about two of them originally so what you're seeing here is actually the final iteration of the uh, project but originally I had uh, a couple of Chinese inverters supplying uh, some of the high voltages uh, but I had to ditch those because of various interference problems you know the the problem with inverters and switching things is that you get lots of interference with voltage spikes and in the end I thought um, I had to go with an external power supply which is uh, what that is over there. Uh, so the external power supply uh, essentially supplies my HT which is about 400 volts which, which is uh, for the uh, deflection plates and also there's a dropping resistor and a few other a voltage well voltage regulator which supplies the HT for the vertical and the horizontal amplifiers and and the uh, voltage that I the, the 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 way I've got round the um, plus uh, 12, 1700 or 1500 volts for the final anode uh, was this clever little module which you can see there which is a a mat susat dada I hope I've pronounced that correctly a high voltage module which uh, will produce up to about 6 kV uh, when it's when I think you put in something like uh, 0 to uh, 12 volts I think it's 12 and it will produce up to 10 kV so what I've done with that is I've used a voltage regulator to limit it to about 3 volts and it will produce about 1700 volts uh, positive for the final anode so that's uh, quite a nice uh, uh, thing if you're building an oscilloscope especially with a big tube and you need um, quite a lot of voltage that actually works pretty well and it doesn't seem to cause an awful lot of interference you know like you know little voltage spikes and things like that which the uh, Chinese amplifier uh, the Chinese uh, power supply uh, did. So most of the uh, components there which you're looking at are for the, the bleeder chain um, for the uh, for the scope and then also on this side you've got the um, 6SN7s 
for the horizontal amplifier. And this stubby little thing here is a 6D10 Compactron triple triode. And uh, that uh, is again on the original ICO circuit diagram, which I showed originally. Now I tried to use uh, a, a 6SN7 and a, a half a 6SN7 because I'm not shortage of holes for valve holders. Uh, but I it didn't I, I I would say that it worked, but not as good as actually using the original sort of Compactron uh, tri uh, triple triode. And I think that may be because the using uh, a six SN7 plus a half a six SN7 probably caused a little bit of extra capacitive effects, which uh, affected the time base. So. Uh, so yeah, that's a cute little valve actually, and it glows quite nicely. Uh, three triodes in one one glass envelope. So I'm going to quickly show you the bottom, and we can have a quick look at that. So underneath, what I've tried to do here, I've tried to use the original tag strips that came with this unit um, to you know to try and keep it reasonably tidy, but it still ended up in a bit of a rat's nest. But hey. So the little circuit board there is our um, vertical uh, amplifier compensation uh, circuit that's on the input. And then we've got on the left uh, the circuitry for the vertical amplifier. And on the right we've got circuitry for the horizontal amplifier. Um, at the back there's a separate um, 6 volt transformer for the CRT tube. Uh, which, um, despite being a bog standard one, seems to be um, uh, reasonably okay, considering that it's got something like minus uh, 1500 or 1200 volts uh, on it, because the uh, heater is is connected to the, uh, the heater and the cathode are connected to the, uh, together. So obviously they've got quite a lot of minus voltages on there, but uh, it doesn't seem to mind. It hasn't had any problems with that. Um, they've got a bleeder resistor there. Uh, sorry, not a bleeder, a dropping resistor, because the voltage the voltage coming into this uh, from the external power supply for the HD for the deflection deflection plates is quite high, so I've had to use that just to drop it down a bit to uh, 400 volts, uh, which that that uh, resistor gets quite uh, quite warm, but it does seem to work. One of the things I did want to do with uh, this scope, instead of just sticking it on the shelf and not using it, was to try and hook it up and actually use it in the shack. So what I've decided to do is to use it as a uh, a monitor, a transmitter monitor of my uh, AM transmitter. So at the moment I've got it rigged up to my uh, AM, my Class E AM transmitter and I've got a a little widget there which is actually demodulating uh, the RF and producing an audio signal. I mean my normal setup with this with this rig is that I have another similar widget which is from uh, Clean RF. I bought these quite a few years ago actually these little handy little boxes and this one actually um, is a sort of RF sniffer which you can connect up to an oscilloscope and you can actually see your modulated uh, signal going out. Now obviously the problem with this scope is that it doesn't cover, it hasn't got the bandwidth uh, to cover you know 3.5 megs which is what we use for AM on, well for this transmitter at least. So what I've decided to do is just to demodulate the audio, the, basically the audio coming out of the transmitter, and then so this gives you a useful monitor, a monitor scope of your uh, audio that's going out um, or, come, or or being demodulated, or so the peop so so the audio that's being broadcast, in other words. Anyhow, let's um, let's quickly uh, put it on transmit. I'll rig up the transmitter so that we're uh, into a dummy load and uh, we can just quickly demonstrate it that it's actually working because it'd be a shame to just sort of build this thing up and 
not actually use it. Okay, let's hope the RF doesn't uh, kill the uh, camera and the scope together. So let's give it a go. One, two, three, four, five. So as you can see there, uh, I'm speaking into my microphone, into my D104, and the transmitter is transmitting into the dummy load. And you can see that the uh, the audio level varies, or you can see get a nice uh, display on the scope. And the good thing is about this uh, oscilloscope, because it's got such a big screen, you know, you don't have to uh, strain your eyes. With a lot of scopes, they're much smaller. And uh, if I talk close to the microphone, you can see the... And uh, so you kind of like, uh, like move it away. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. It's quite a sensitive microphone on this, so you can actually... So that's now uh, with the microphone about two foot away. And I can... You, you can still see that there's, uh, there's speech peaks coming through. And if I bring it closer, it's obviously much, uh, much stronger. So. You, you know, by watching that monitor scope, you can sort of uh, make sure that you're, you've you got the right level of audio. Anyhow, I thought that was uh, quite a nice uh, thing to use this oscilloscope for. So, until the next project, 73s, and catch you again soon.